Okay, good morning, everybody. Well, that's for for the Chilean participants. <laughs> Some of you might be connecting from further away in different time zones, but thank you very much for connecting. It is my honor to introduce today's speaker, Vicente Parot. Uh, so, buenos dias, todos. Um, so, Vicente is one of the professors leading the Libre Hub project together with me. And this is a particularly interesting topic today because we will have an upcoming workshop at the end of the year about this topic. So here you can already get a bit of a flavor about current developments that are going on. And if you're interested in this, maybe you'll be able to join us later on to actually um, build something related to the presentation today in a later workshop and use it in your research. So without further ado, or well, maybe I can say a couple more things. So Vicente um, is also a young assistant professor here at the Institute for Biological and Medical Engineering. And um, he has spent the last many years actually in Boston and US at Harvard to do a PhD and postdoc. Um, and there's still a number of collaborations going on and um, interesting insights for technology development projects that are going on over there. Um, but now we are building all this development infrastructure here in Chile. So with that, thank you very much for presenting today, Vicente, and we're looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much, Tobias, for that uh, nice introduction. So in the in the talk today, I plan to to uh, talk um, introduce some of the research that I that I've been doing, and uh, mainly to. Uh, show the motivation of why um, I have an interest in controlling light sources and other synchronization of signals with precision. And so after I, like, I explain that, I'll, I'll then mention a few of the developments that we're doing um, right here, right now in Chile uh, to continue some of these projects. So in my research, I developed uh, computational imaging tools and during a number of years, I specialized in um, am I, I'm sorry, let me, I think I had a problem with the screen sharing, but let me share it again. Hopefully you can see it now. Can you see that, Tobias? Yes. Good. So now I think it should be fine. So during a number of years, I've been specializing in developing tools to study the brain. And in, in, a, in the last few decades, there has been a revolution in development of optical tools to study neuronal activity. So one example is the field of optogenetics in which neurons can be made artificially sensitive to light. And this allows studying the behaviors of animals and studying causal relationships between activity in neural circuits and behaviors of the animals. And on the other hand, we have tools also to measure neural activity. So in these two videos here, there, there are prime examples of this, these technologies. In the first video, a light turns on and a mouse uh, starts uh, running. And so this modifies directly their behavior. And in the second video, there's um, thousands of neurons of a mouse that is running on a treadmill in, under a microscope. So we can see the activity of the mouse. And these technologies can be combined to, to as I said, to study the, the behaviors in a detailed fashion. So in some of the projects, I was uh, focusing on developing tools for using in a model called the, the acute slices. So this is a model which is not used to study behavior, but it's a classic model in neurophysiology because it allows physical access to any region of the brain and you can get to the neurons and study the properties of the local neural circuits. So this allows um, uh, studying uh, the, the mechanisms that um, allow the, all the intrinsic properties of the of the neurons, such as the excitability, the, their connectivity, and the response to perturbations, such as pharmacology or temperature. But this technique has always been a low throughput technique. So in this extreme picture here, multiple electrodes are used to measure a handful of neurons from one site in, a, in one of these brain slices. However, this is a time-consuming process, and 
it's not scalable to study many neurons or many regions. So in several projects, I worked to develop tools for large area all optical neurophysiology. This is to use these optical tools to study the, the physiology of neurons over a large area in brain slices. So the main progress on the molecular side was done in collaboration with uh, Sami Fari. So here we paired a channel rhodopsin that is blue shifted with a calcium reporter that is orange shifted. And so this allowed simultaneous manipulation of uh, neuronal activity and measurement of their excitation using two different colors in the microscope. Because otherwise, the response of the tenoropsin and the um, excitation of the reporters is uh, overlapping, and this can be difficult. But we optimized this uh, combination of proteins, and this allows measurements like the example that we recorded here, where when we shine flashes of blue light, we see that the neurons have action potentials recorded here in black. And then this is followed by an increase in the calcium concentration inside the neurons, which is shown here in the recording in red. So uh, a neuron here is shown expressing both of this reporter and equator. And this is the, the, the molecular tools that we use to, to study the neuronal excitability, the, re the response to excitations. And then another important component is the microscopy, which is where I'm, I'm uh, most expert in developing these um, computational tools. And so we designed a, a large area microscope that has um, a five millimeter field of view uh, with cellular resolution. And to avoid the problems of um, white field background fluorescence, we use some ideas from electrical engineering using digital codes of illumination and patterns that allows separating the signals from the focal plane and from the background. So using this method, uh, here is an example of a white field picture that has all this um, fluorescence background. But then when we take a picture only of the focal plane using the digital codes, then we obtain signals that are specific from neurons that are in the focal plane. And this allows rejecting the mixed signals when we want to record the activity of different neurons. So we, I showed here molecular tools and optical tools, and then we applied these methods for studying the excitability of neurons. And so expressing these two proteins in, in the brain of a mouse, and then using these brain slices for doing the measurements, we then developed an optogenetic stimulation protocol in which we record the activity of the, I mean, we record the, the calcium concentration using the orange reporter. And we record this before and after pulses of blue light stimulation. And this blue light stimulation is done in, in a train of pulses and we repeat it at increasing levels of intensity of blue light. This allows recording um, a type of signature of how the neurons respond and how do they saturate to the excitation, the, the artificial excitation from the channel ROPS. So one example here is when we just compare the fluorescence of the calcium before and after the excitations, we see um, the example as I'm showing here. All the white dots are neurons where the reporter is expressed and all the red dots are uh, neurons where the, the fluorescence increased after the stimulations. So this allows measuring how prone are the cells to being excited by our stimulation. And in particular, when we look at the diversity of how the neurons respond, here there are shown three examples of neurons that are nearby in a, in a small region, but we see that there's a variety of of how they do respond. Some of them saturate more quickly, some of them saturate more slowly. And then we also see that the shape of these responses is um, correlated with their anatomical position. So this tells us that there's some uh, information here related to the location of the neurons in the brain. However, here the coloring is just showing the different responses. It, it doesn't have any biological meaning. For that, we study how the 
excitability is perturbed by using, for example, anti-epileptic drugs. So here, the experiment is to measure the baseline excitability, and then we uh, uh, wait a little bit and apply this uh, drug perturbation. And then we measure again the altered excitability in the presence of the um, anti-epileptic. So uh, and here, by the way, I'm, I'm explaining this uh, a bit fast, but we did different experiments in which we use these different anti-epileptic drugs. And this way, we can make a map, for example, for one of them, of how the neurons activity is modulated by the presence of the drug. So in this map here in green is shown a stronger inhibition by the antibiotic vetigabine. When we study multiple of these drugs, we see that they have different inhibition profiles across the different layers of the cortex. In particular, for the case of vetigabine, we see that this is correlated with the target of the drug that we can study its location just by static methods. Uh, other existing methods allow staining, for example, for looking for the receptor. So this is um, another way of uh, getting related information. Although in the method that uh, we are developing, we study the, the life properties of the neuron and how the activity is modulated rather than looking just for the receptor. So the, in, a, in other examples, we, we use this, um, I want to show some more images because in other examples we uh, developed uh, also, I mean, we, we use different genetic targeting strategies. And so by targeting the actuator and the reporter to different neuronal populations, then we can study what, what we call the functional connectivity. How, how does the reporter population respond when we stimulate the actuator population? So in this case, we have different populations that are labeled with the actuator and reporter here shown in blue and in orange. So when we look for changes, um, let me explain here what happens. In, in magenta, we record the responses in the baseline condition, but then similar to the experiment I explained previously, we apply synaptic blockers that shut off the communication between these two neuronal populations. And then we see that there are some neurons that increase their activity when we apply the synaptic blockers. So this is consistent with some mechanisms of this inhibition that has re been reported previously in these neuronal populations. And but it's a it's a this is an example that would be difficult to study if you were looking for these neurons one by one because they are a sparse population. And so if you want if you wanted to study for example, where are they distributed? Then you would need to, to make measurements in different locations of the brain slice, but that would probably mean studying in different animals and, and it's definitely a more difficult thing to infer from here. So um, this is, all the examples I've been showing are using the measurement of calcium activation. So I, I showed you these molecular tools and this microscopy that we use to record the functional properties, always recording the functional um, information about the calcium activation, which is on the order of a tenth of a second or a second, depends on the, on the dynamics in, in, in some cases, but the, um, this um, accumulation of calcium is a relatively slow process that happens when you have multiple excitations of the neuron. But these excitations really come from the, originally from the electrical activity of the neuron. And in the case of the action potentials, which last about a millisecond, we can also, we also have molecular tools to measure them. There, there are pair, pairings of voltage reporters and channel rods that, that you can use, for example, in the case of this movie to record how an action potential propagates through a neuron. This is uh, using a, a different technique that I'm not describing here. But what I do want to describe is that we combine this um, method of microscopy using the um, patterns illumination to record the fast dynamics of the action potentials. So to, 
solve this problem, I, I worked in collaboration with another colleague at uh, Catholic University, Carlos Simlon, and we used ideas from other fields again um, to develop uh, an algorithm for compressed sensing. This has been used before, for example, in MRI images of, of moving heart and other stuff. And so uh, in this algorithm, the trick is that we use uh, um, a fast projection of patterns of illumination. And then we use um, a demodulation method. I, I won't go into many details here, but there's a, there's a computational algorithm that is paired with the, um, the way that we illuminate the sample. So if we get the pictures with the right illumination patterns, then we uh, can reconstruct again the um, signals from the optical section with the fast um, activity that we plan to record. So in this example, <clears throat> um, these two rows show the difference of recording neurons using the wide field uh, method and the structured illumination method. So in this, uh, maybe I'll explain a bit more detail here, but we have multiple neurons in the tissue. The tissue is, the, the brain tissue is a very dense um, concentration of neurons and their processes that are all intertwined. So it, normally for recordings of the action potentials, we need to make a sparse expression of the reporter in the target population. Meaning that if we have a dense expression, it would be difficult to extract these signals because they are going to be mixed together. Part of the difficulty is that we have a short time to do the measurements with because we want to record the action potentials that can last a few milliseconds only. So uh, this means that we have to take fast movies with the camera. And so in the example here, this experiment shows the recording of two neurons that are nearby, a slight difference in depth. So when we record with the wide field method, which is the, the other standard, when we try to get the signals from one neuron, we find that we not only get the action potentials of that neuron, but we also have um, a mixture of the neuron in the background that has also a partial information here in, in its own action potentials. So this is a problem because usually the, the detection of the action potentials is limited by the noise. And if we have noise coming from other cells, this makes it very difficult to extract the actual potentials. So by applying the optical section method using the patterns, we are able to capture um, a high contrast of the cell membrane, which is where the reporter is located, and also capture the fast dynamics of the actual potential. So um, <clears throat> this, is, um, this is an example where we use, again, pattern illumination, but now we, we push it to the fast limit in which we don't need to record a full sequence of patterns to in order to make an optical section, but we use this compressed sensing method to accelerate the, the measurement. In a, in a different example of the same technique, we also measured, uh, for example, zebrafish. So this way we can measure larger fields of view at slower speeds that are well adapted to measure uh, calcium, for example, in the activation of the neurons in the zebrafish brain. So I've been showing you, so far, I'm, I've been showing you these different techniques for measuring neurophysiology. So, uh, but they're all based on optical tools to, to probe the neural function. So in, in one case, we use this for calcium recordings in large areas in, in acute brain slices. In, in another case, we used compressed sensing to measure also very fast dynamics, but in smaller fields of view. Well, actually we, we uh, not shown here, but we also did these two together. So we applied the compressed sensing also to the brain slices, but that, that's, uh, I guess, more details in the, there are always more details in the papers. The, the important thing is that I want to give um, a general overview of the types of um, biomedical optics that I've been working with. And also specifically, I want to show the, um, <clears throat> I want to go back to some of the problems that we encountered here, because here in this um, 
all optical excitability protocol is a, is a good example. These uh, movies that we use pattern illumination to record um, sequences of uh, pictures to reconstruct uh, optical sections. So this all requires um, a precise synchronization of camera triggering and triggering of patterns that are uh, changing in a projector. And importantly, we also have, a, um, we need a precise triggering of the stimulation to, to for the actuator, the channel relapsing. So this actuator, for example, is stimulated with um, 488 nanometer light here, and this is blue light, but we want to um, maximize the neuronal activity that we stimulate with, with a given dose of light. This is because if we if we shine too much blue light, we may induce other photo damage in the in the samples or in the neurons. And the, on the other hand, the actual potentials that are generated when the channel option is uh, opened, they last a few milliseconds and have, and have a refractory period in which you, you cannot simulate more action potentials in the same very short interval. So we have to, we, the, the optimization we did allowed us to use, for example, trains of pulses that are going to make multiple action potentials, but in independent moments when the neuron is not still in the refractory period. Basically, this allows us to maximize the calcium increase so that we can measure it effectively at, with these short exposure times. And, but in particular for the illumination, we need to trigger these lights um, with short time windows and also control their amplitudes precisely. We have to calibrate the, the power of the, um, of the light that we're using to make sure that the intensity that, we, that we're using is um, reproducible between different experiments. This is because um, we, we already have noise, for example, from the different levels of expression of the channel But when we, um, so we, what we do to overcome these problems is to compare the excitability before and after a drug. So this allows, allows us to look at the changes in the calcium ex, um, increases. And this avoids most of the problems caused by different expression of each of these proteins. However, we it's I just want to stress that it's particularly important that not only we have the, the stimulation precise in time, but we also want to make sure that it has the right uh, power each time that we apply it. Otherwise, we could be seeing effects that are just derivative of an, an uncontrolled power in the stimulation. And similarly for the um, for this other example of the um, Hadamard uh, pattern recordings, when we when we measure um, action potentials at um, uh, 500 hertz, um, for to do this recording, we have to take pictures with patterns that are repeated at one kilohertz. So this means that every millisecond we took a picture with a different pattern in the sample. And we not only want to target the illumination uh, using these spatial patterns, but we want to, again, turn on and off the light at precise moments that are recorded with these patterns. So this all means basically that we have to have a triggering of these signals from a computer usually, but could also be from a microcontroller or other devices. And so I wanted to, to get to this point, uh, basically painting a picture of the research that, that I was doing in these projects and also showing some of the challenges in the, in the synchronization and in the precise control of light that we need to do in order to do these measurements. So the, um, going back then to, to kind of closing this area, I, I can mention that we have advanced in implementing now the next generation of this neurophysiology microscope in Santiago. So uh, we have a collaboration with the um, with Rodrigo del Rio at the uh, Faculty of Biology in Catholic University, and we already built there this um, the new, as I mentioned, the new version of this microscope where we are going to 
hopefully soon start uh, some of these neurophysiology experiments. But in the meantime, we are still doing some of the uh, last uh, details in preparing the, for example, the illumination. So at this point, I wanted to uh, switch gears a little bit and then just talk more about the illumination in microscopy. But first, maybe um, if we, well, if there's any question about the, the research, I can, I can um, address it now. And well, I guess we can also do it at the end. But if anyone has a burning question, uh, you uh, can do it. All right. So I want to, um, I have a, a kind of a very basic um, presentation here about the um, illumination in fluorescent microscopy, and I'll just be talking about some of its, its aspects. First, I wanted to mention several different light sources that are used in microscopy. And well, I'll be focusing mainly in fluorescence microscopy, but um, first I wanted to mention that uh, just, just for historical context, that for many years, the main illumination source for microscopy was the sun, actually. So microscopes used to have a little mirror and you would usually just direct the, 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 um, the light shining from the sun directly with this mirror into your sample to look in, in transmission mode with white light. But this, of course, is not um, adapted to the era of fluorescent microscopy in which we need light of a much higher intensity usually and also um, we need um, kind of much more technology than, than what's shown in the microscope in this picture. So basically the sun is uh, out of the question for, for the new methods. But one, one typical um, source of light that is uh, present in many commercial microscopes are just white lights that are usually incandescent lights. Um, they can be um, Type, different types like halogen lamps or arc lamps, but uh, they may look like a box like, uh, like this one here. And I should say that the versatility of these lights is that because you have a, a, a full spectrum, then you can use color filters to, to just pick any color you need. However, they, they are um, inefficient because uh, to use one specific color, you, you just discard all of the other light and the other, well, but in, in many applications where you need white light, it's very useful to have one of these uh, sources. But the, the two ones that I want to mainly focus now, um, which are actually the, the two types of um, illumination I'm installing in, in this new microscope, it are, are the LED and the laser. So LEDs are, they provide um, also a, a relatively broad spectrum, but that is not um, full spectrum. It's not white. The, you you have you have white LEDs also, but there are LEDs available at single colors that have um, um, relatively broad spectrum, but but as I said, a specific color. And these the main feature of these um, light sources is that they are incoherent. They are. Uh, pretty efficient. Uh, they, they generate a lot of light for the um, energy they use. And they can be high powered, they can be small. Importantly, they are very stable. These are solid state semiconductor devices and the, the, you have simple electronics that, that put a current there and, and you will have um, a very steady light that you can uh, turn on and off very quickly. And so this is super useful. And the availability of different colors allows you to, to mix them. Also, you know, have different, um, whatever colors you need for your microscope, you, you have many options to pick from. But it's not um, always super straightforward to use them because for microscopy, many times you, you, you can buy, of course, uh, commercial devices that, that have a lot of um, uh, kind of research grade um, good features for your experiment, but uh, actually because they are very simple electronics, you, you can also build it yourself. It's just that it's not necessarily obvious all the different steps. The other important light source in microscopy is the, um, especially for fluorescent microscopy, is the, the lasers. So the 
the main features of the lasers that are different from the LEDs is that the lasers provide a coherent illumination. And while this goes deep into, into the physics of how the coherent light is generated, but this essentially causes the light to have a, a really very, very narrow spectrum. It's like a, like a single frequency instead of a, a broad spectrum like the LEDs. And also they can have a very high power, sometimes much, much higher than the LED. Although this does depend on the color and the technology of the lasers. There are many different types of lasers. They come in all different colors and sizes. But uh, some of the ones, some of the expensive ones that are used for microscopy are very simple to use and, and you have all the colors, they're very nice. There are of course other options and depending on, on the requirements of the experiment, you can trade off some of their qualities and, and get uh, cheaper lasers. But the, I would say the main feature of the laser light is that you can focus it very sharply with a high power. This is not really possible with LEDs. So you can have um, a lot of light overall with LED, but if you want to focus in a, in a tiny spot, you can get much higher powers with a laser than with an LED. So this is very important for the type of scanning microscopes. In those cases, they, they many times they usually use lasers. So, by the way, I'm, I'm focusing here, my mindset is uh, put on the wide field microscopes and on having multiple colors for fluorescence microscopy, as I showed in, in some of the examples before um, in these experiments. So we, I want, to, I want the, the microscope I'm building to have um, a versatile functionality that you can use it for different experiments using different colors, both for functional imaging and for um, structural imaging of, of static samples. But uh, to have versatility, then you need to be able to switch and, and control different uh, colors of these lights in, in a modular fashion. So let me mention, I want to, to say, how do you, let's say you have multiple colors of um, LED or laser light, and then how do you mix them? So, and again, I'm focusing on the, um, on the microscope where we have all this versatility, of course, it allows you to install it the, the way you need for any experiment, but also you have to be putting your hands in, into this work and, and doing some of these configurations yourself, because uh, of course, none of this is uh, important to know in a commercial microscope where everything is turnkey. We just uh, turn on the software and use it. But uh, for just for understanding a little bit more how do different colors work in the microscope, I want to mention how are they combined. So if you have multiple color sources for that you want to use for multicolor imaging or for, let's say, UV or blue stimulation of different samples or for the chemistry or, or for um, optogenetics, then you can have all these simultaneously in a microscope. And so the typical method to join colors in free space is to use dichroic mirrors. So similar to the dichroic mirrors in the, the, the main dichroic mirror of a fluorescent microscope, you, you can have these colored filters that allow you to mix uh, different colors of samples of uh, light sources. So this is an, kind of an extreme examples that has how many other six colors uh, that are mixed together into one beam that is illuminating the sun. And then this is useful for free space optics. Uh, and so this, this will be good for LEDs and also for lasers that are uh, traveling in free space. However, if you have uh, light that is uh, inside a fiber, to couple it in, into the microscope, then you have these other devices called fiber combiners. So these are just uh, waveguides that will mix the channels. And so you can have multiple inputs, you can flag each one uh, in a different color. And then you can have one output that has a combined um, combination of, uh, I mean, combined combination of this, but uh, that has all the colors together. So uh, by the way, if you mix multiple colors of any of these types of light, you can also emulate um, something similar to a white light that you, that you can use for everyday observation. So then another um, 
field I wanted to mention a bit is that there is um so in my work I've also relied on on um, having advanced modulation of the light in in space and in time. So the um, the space modulation is really um, it can be very complicated because it, it goes deep into electrical engineering and also in the physics of how these devices work. But we usually we, we have uh, patterns that are made with projectors. This is not actually that complicated to do. Uh, but also we have other spatial light modulators that, that use um, uh, electro-optic devices. But I wanted to mention here also more specifically, how do you modulate the light in time, which is um, much more important important to do, I would I would say, for general use and also um, less complicated. And so um, I, I would say that the main important ways to modulate the light, you can have electronic methods, which is maybe the simplest one. You just control the electronics so that your LED, let's say, turns on and off. So this way you can control uh, to have different intensities over time. And you have um, you have different properties, um, so but but this I would say is the, is the main um, method of modulation. You can also have uh, mechanical shutters, so this is useful for for when you want to make sure that the the light is shut completely um, in some time. Depending on the light source, um, there are some light sources that when you turn them off electronically, they they don't necessarily reduce their power 100%, they, they may reduce to a load light, load light level, but not 100%. So this type of um, issues, you can make sure that all the light is shut if you have a mechanical door inside, in front of the light. So for free space optics, there are some um, mechanical shutters that, that are very fast. And also for fiber optics, uh, you, you have um, the modulators, Th those are not mechanical, uh, are actually electro optic devices, but you can also um, turn on and off the light. Um, I guess that's in the next category. So I have here electro optic devices, but here um, I, I would say this is also an important uh, method for modulation of light because, in even though, for example, I haven't implemented this myself in Chile, another uh, common type of modulation that I used before in microscopes that have many different colors of laser light is um, uh, th there's something called, for example, an, an acousto-optic tunable filter. And so uh, this device has a crystal that when stimulated with a mechanical wave will produce diffraction in the light of different colors that is going through. But then you, so here you can control electronically the, um, the diffraction for the different uh, colors of light simultaneously. And so you have an input beam that is already has all the combined colors, and then you can um, diffract these beams. So you, you put the default configuration in no light going to the microscope. But then when you turn on the diffraction, you have the light going to the microscope. So this switching can be done uh, with um, electronic control using a radio frequency amplifier. And here you can have um, switching times in, in the order of, of um, lower than a millisecond, basically, but in the order of microseconds. So this allows to, in, in any experiments where you, you need like really sharp control of the timing of multiple colors, then this is super useful because you, you control them all in the same device. But, but it's also difficult to configure. But I would say for many applications, um, this is not uh, necessary. Uh, and the electronic and mechanical shutter is um, more than sufficient. So I think those are the, um, the main ones that I'll be using soon in, in my microscope. And so this is a, a bit of general information about light sources and their switching. And um, hopefully that's uh, useful if uh, some of you were interested in this part. And I want to mention also, um, I actually don't have too much information, but but I want to mention some of the work that we are doing in the implementation of these um, devices um, in, in our local version. So first I want to uh, mention, so one very important um, source of inspiration has been an implementation 
of a laser illuminator that has been published by the Prakash lab in, at Stanford. So here they use low cost uh, diode lasers that are coupled to multi-mode fibers. Then these are combined uh, with one of these fiber combiners that, are, that I mentioned. And finally, there's, um, there's something called speckle that arises when you have um, coherent light uh, traveling in a multi-mode uh, channel like these multi-mode fibers. So this speckle can be something good or bad, uh, important or not for your experiment. And so in the, um, light, source, in the light source that they published, they basically described uh, like a super cheap uh, this speckler, which they show in this picture, in, in this blue fiber. But then they say that that's actually not very good. And so they use an expensive one for the experiments. And so this is kind of a problem because we, we are not sure we want to. So we basically we decided not to get this expensive part. And so the version that we are installing here is, is similar to this one, but um, we are, or we, so first we have a different um, diffuser in the, um, in the collimation of the light that uh, takes care of most of the speckle problem. And then we also um, uh, do something that is uh, related to stabilizing the face of the laser so that we the speckle is not changing over time during the experiment. But this, at the end, is a um, work in progress. We're also exploring other alternative cheap ways of modulating the speckle. To, to see, I mean, if we when we learn more about those, we can probably recommend uh, some alternatives uh, to the one shown in this picture. But essentially we are implementing something very similar here. The key is that uh, lasers, as I said, can be very expensive or very cheap. So these, the lasers here, the, the diode lasers that are coupled to multi-mode fibers, this can be uh, pretty cheap. So you can get a, a high power module for, for let's say a hundred dollars. Um, but these have um, a lot of power and they're really super useful. You can switch them fast. And well, in the details, they, they do have differences with the LEDs. For example, the, they don't have um, such a, um, a stable emission of light. They can have some fluctuation and um, depending, I think this also depends on the current source that we use. So, so we have been using mostly cheap ones so far. Anyway, but the, um, so in, in our microscope in, in Santiago, um, here I just wanted to show the, the essential components of one of these um, fiber coupled laser diodes. And so the, this installation in the slide shows the, the, the area of the, of the projector in our microscope, which is in those um, electronic boards over there and that, and that camera lens. But the light source is here. So we have in, in an optical table, a small electronics module. This is the current source. And then there are some cables. Actually, the ones in the picture are not connected, but um, believe me, if you connect these cables there, then it works. <laughs> so the, you have a few cables and the this little part um, in, a, in a black box here is the laser diode. This is then coupled to um, multi-mode fiber that is then coupled into a collimator that has an integrated diffuser. All the rest of the parts are, are not part of the um, illumination. But this collimation enables the, then you launch the light in a, in a forward fashion as you need for going into a microscope part. And so this is essentially the um, our, our part of our, I mean, we, we also, as I mentioned, are, are developing many different colors. So this picture is a, a little bit older and now it, it looks, it has uh, the combiner and, and several other stuff. But uh, what's shown in the picture is essentially what we will be developing in the workshop with LibreHab. So if you're interested in that, please stay tuned for, for um, the next uh, few months that we will be announcing more details. And um, so, and, and still before I finish, I wanted to mention, so the other part that of our development are these, um, we are also using LED light. So may, basically we have different colors in, in different versions. And sometimes we, we do have redundancy because for some applications, for example, you want 
the, the uh, most intense blue light, but for some others, like the optogenetics, you want to make sure that you can control the power very reliable and you need actually uh, low intensities. So the LED is also great. But anyway, for the LEDs, in order to maximize the, the, their light output in, in high power LEDs, we have um, perfected the, I mean, this is, this is nothing uh, incredibly complicated for someone who knows how to do it, but we have standardized a way of installing the LEDs in a dissipator that allows you to, to turn them on with, at, at their full power. And then uh, we also have um, a, a small recipe for installing them in a tube that makes a very stable connection. So of course you can simplify this even further. If you if you are happy with plastic parts, you can 3D print some of these. But um, if you if you just want something reliable that will give you multiple colors of LED, we have also um, studied uh, different sources of colors and and what's their I mean, uh, cheap LEDs that you can buy from Chile from different places, and what are the, the most intense ones that you can get for different colors. So then to control this, um, I briefly mentioned before that you can also use an expensive um, parent source, but we are also developing um, a, a special circuit that allows you to control, let's say four different illumination sources using either automatic signals that come from a computer or the manual signals that you can turn by hand. This is useful because when you do all these, um, if you do if you do any experiment with automatic switching of the lights, while you're not doing the experiment, while you're, when you're positioning the sample or you're trying different things, you want to know, for example, what's the intensity that you need to set and stuff like that, then you always, uh, it's useful to have something that, that you can switch the lights easy on and off and so on. So we are, we built here a circuit for using a current source and then distributing this current for four LEDs. So you can, as I said, use it either manually or switching it automatically from a microcontroller. So um, these, um, all this information on these laser sources and, and LED controllers is um, still not fully, uh, published and, and uh, finished 100%, but if you want to know more details, please uh, talk to me. In the meantime, I want to thank uh, people who have worked on this, especially Ruth Vallejos, who did um, a lot of the installations and, and inventory that, that I showed in the last few slides. And um, with that, I want to finish this uh, seminar and thank you for your participation. Thank you so much, Vicente, for a very interesting presentation about your research uses of illumination sources and your current work. I guess you can so, re-moderate the questions yourself. I think we have a couple of minutes left for the seminar. Yeah, yeah, we have a few minutes, but um, any, do you have any questions? Well, while the others are thinking about their questions, can you tell us a little bit more about your current setup? Uh, there, there's Pierre next. So I'm particularly, well, I've had been, a, I've seen already a little bit more <laughs> from our work together, um, but I'm still unsure what this uh, fiber spool holder does that, uh, that it was also shown on your picture on the top level of the, of the illumination setup. Um, yeah, this sort of black holder where the fiber is wrapped around. Could you detail yeah. that? Yeah, so the, uh, that, that's uh, nothing too complicated, actually. So the, there's a um, plastic part here that um, holds the fiber. And this is, um, I mean, it's, it's, this is not a key piece of the equipment. The thing is that these optical fibers are quite fragile. So if, if they bend over a certain curvature, they, they will break. That, that's the main problem. So you don't want to accidentally trip over them. And so in the for, in the implementation here by uh, the Prakash lab, 
So this picture here, I think it's intended to show you all the parts and, and understand how are they connected. But I, I don't think this is actually how you would use it um, ever because you don't want to have this uh, spaghetti of different fibers that are that will be tangled together and, and prone to breaking if, if you move things around them. So that's one thing. Like this, they just have the tape there on the side because I've seen it in action in their lab. The, the yellow tape? Yeah, so they just have a bit of tape and they leave it like this. But yeah, maybe it's a little bit risky. I, I get the point. No, no, no. It's a, I mean, of course you can use it there. And so actually they, they do have an acrylic there. And if you have everything secured to the acrylic, then you're good to go. In my case, um, our microscope, for example, is in a neurophysiology lab. And we there are no engineers there. So most of the people who will be using it are biologists and we definitely don't want to have any um, free fibers, I think, because anything that, that is uh, kind of a known movement would be a problem. Then, but another important factor that I wanted to mention is that the, the speckle patterns uh, that come out of this illumination are also um, changed in a kind of chaotic way by the configuration of the fiber. So if, if you make any, really small mechanical movement of the fiber, then the patterns will change. And so this is uh, one of the um, things that we have uh, been doing that if you stabilize the fiber accordingly, then uh, this problem of the patterns actually it may not be a problem. And uh, this may be a good way of um, illuminating without using like, like kind of an expensive uh, dispeckler and still having a very good um, illumination. So. The, I think another key difference is, as I mentioned, the, the diffuser part. Uh, there you design exactly how the coherence will um, interfere at the sample. And so that's also something that may play a role in, in making a difference. Pierre, you have more questions? Yes, so thank you, Isate, for, for your presentation. Um, I would like to know, um, according to your experience, which child the benefits or and limitation that you have found uh, working in this case of using 3D printing for optics. Um, because, well, if you change some parameters or materials and also the 3D printers, then maybe the results won't be the same. I don't know if you have experienced this or in this case, uh, all the 3D printed parts that you have used um, are uh, useful for what you are uh, doing right now. Yeah, that's a good point. I think the um, so in the um, I'm, I've mostly used um, optomechanics um, from uh, professional companies that that provide these um, um, steel and, and aluminum parts. So I, I what I can say is that the, um, this is important in experiments that you have very stringent uh, precision requirements. So I would say this is not the case for uh, regular fluorescent microscopy, but uh, it's, it, it is probably important if you are doing uh, like, for example, super resolution experiments, or if you're doing very sensitive measurements. Uh, in these cases, uh, when, when you're trying to detect something with very high sensitivity in general, you are fighting against the noise that you will have from other sources from the background. So, mechanical instability that you could have from uh, plastic parts may introduce a variation in your measurements that uh, may be a problem for detecting small signals. But it's very important that it depends where do you have this mechanical instability, this may or may not be a problem. So yeah, for um, I, I think it really depends on the measurement you're doing. Then another thing I want to mention is that if you are using interferometric methods or methods that use um, the phase stability of the light uh, coherence, then I think it, it makes an, a very important difference if you like if you have anything that is uh, not super solid, then you will have phase drift that, that is uh, much higher and, and difficult to control. So this is something that, that uh, we observe also we are. I'm also working in, in, in a project in the microscope using uh, interference um, in the pattern illumination from a coherent source. And there it's, um, I, so I, plastic hasn't been a problem for me so far, but 
I would say it would definitely influence uh, how the stability of these systems is um, is um, is something. But but as I said, that's um, in applications where we use um, coherence of the light, for example, interference. This may not be. This is not the case in in general for us in my customer. Good. Any more immediate questions? Oh, well, so perfect on time. So then maybe I'll just um, thank you one more for sharing this interesting work with us. And then we'll upload the video as always also on YouTube so it can be shared and viewed later by others. Thanks once more. Thank you. Soon. Thank you very much for everyone. Bye-bye.